call the meeting to order. I believe Councillor Bate will be here shortly. She sent a note to Bill saying she might be a little late. Um, so at this point, uh, it is 6.31. Uh, so are there any changes that anyone is proposing to the agenda? Anything that we can pull off? Um, I had a question about the number five, the property tax bill discussion. I, I think Bill might have some input yeah, well, to I offer. was just going to say, I think that can be taken off. Councilmember Kruger had asked that that be put on. I didn't hear any follow-up. Oh, um, I thought the clerk after, had responded. So they've... Are we good? What to We're do? good with the, the property, property tax. tax. Oh. The state's, state's got state. it. Yeah, yeah that's, okay. I'm sorry, that's coming uh, Friday. Okay, then we can take it off. Okay, so we can, okay, so we can remove it, item number five. <laughs> and then we had uh, the add-on items, one consent agenda item and two regular items, presumably executive session at the end of the meeting. You could, you could pull off the license discussion again and punt it, although I do think it'd probably be quick. It's up to y'all. Happy to do it. I'm happy to do it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right, so do we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Second. Aye. All right. Aye. So now general businesses, business and appearances, this is a chance for members of the public who are here to address the council about issues that are not on tonight's agenda. Um, any issues that are on tonight's agenda, we just ask that you uh, save your comments for those agenda items when they come up. Mr. Dworkin? I'm just removing the agenda, but I don't believe the TIF is on there anywhere. It is um, not on for this week. So uh, my name is Sam Dworkin. I live on Cherry Avenue here in Montpelier. Um, I wanted to comment about the TIF district. I know that at the meeting where the council voted to approve the first phase of it, I had asked a question about the assumption that all growth is because of the TIF district, which seemed unreasonable to me, but the response was that's how we do it. I would just draw the council's attention. There was an article in seven days on July 18th <coughs> called Proof Negative, Auditor Documents Lack of Evidence for Business Incentives. And it's a long article, mostly talking about statements uh, from uh, the auditor, Doug Hoffer, for the state. But one, the general overall point is that a lot of money in the state is spent on things where there's not actually any way to measure what's happening or not a good way to measure it. And a chunk of that article specifically calls out the fact that TIF districts are based on this incorrect assumption that there would be no growth in our city without this magic district and that surveys from around the, based on the article and the auditor's comments it appears that a lot of different effort looking into food tip districts actually help are never able to prove if that's going on and so i would ask if the council still believes that there would be no growth in the tip area of montpelier without the tiff and if they've considered the position of the auditor of the state on these issues Thank you, Sam. Sam. Any other general business or appearances? Council members, anyone? Okay, moving on. Uh, the consent agenda. Any? I move that we approve the consent agenda. I'll second. All right. Any further discussion? I'm sorry for doing this so late, but I don't completely understand the, uh, the EC fiber membership and so I would ask that we take that up uh, just to have a, a bit more discussion about it. Certainly. Um, would you envision that we add it later on in the agenda or would you like to take it up between between the consent agenda and um, the uh, DRB? Whatever is your pleasure. Uh, let's just do it. We can do it right after the consent agenda. Okay. So I move that we approve the consent agenda less item believe it is uh, G. G. Connor, is, I think it's friendly second. amendment. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Uh, so let's pull item G, the EC fiber membership withdrawal resolution. Um, so basically this is pretty simple. We have been members of EC fiber since its inception. It's creating a fiber network down near um, in the upper valley, I guess you'd say, and is not contiguous to the city, so it's pretty clear they will never serve us with direct service. Um, we had a appointments that were due in the spring. We hadn't appointed somebody. They, they called us and asked if we were gonna appoint members. I brought it to the council's attention. At that point, you opted not to fill the appointments and expressed the desire that we withdraw from the district. 
Uh, we discussed it. It was, I guess, at the next meeting, Mr. Whitaker objected to us doing that. We took no action, and it hasn't been on the agenda since. I s recently received a communication from EC Fiber just wanting to know uh, where we stood and could we take a f make a formal stand one way or the other. So we drafted this resolution to withdraw <laughs> since that is the direction which um, you had seemed that you wanted to go. So I guess I, I'm, I'm looking at Jack because I'm not sure what his questions are. I think we should yeah, suss I'm those out. Wondering uh, if you have a clear response to what Steve Whitaker's objections were. It might have been my first meeting. Well, as I understand, and he's here. And, uh, I'd be happy to have him. Yeah, I, I would never be presumed to speak for Mr. Whitaker. But as I understand his point, and it's not uh, it's not without some merit, is that um, EC Fibers had some success they've they've got some fiber running they've got got it going and they've and that if we are members that we we might be able to leverage the fact that we'll never get service by saying hey you know we're your member at least come and help central vermont internet get started provide some technical expertise um, i'm paraphrasing and i'd certainly rather let him speak for himself uh, but my sense in speaking with EC Fiber is that they would be willing to provide that expertise anyway, but it's really up to the, the council on this. But I'd, I'd defer that. I, I would. Uh, I, I just can Mr. you. Okay. for the record, uh, I would differ with the opinion that we will never get service. Uh, the way fiber optics works, their their fiber connects to the same fiber that connects at our substation out on River Street. Uh, they can connect us to the bigger internet quicker than any other way. Uh, we just have to establish the hop from downtown village fiber or heat plant fiber out to this electrical substation out by the wood stove store. So the fact that we have been a member for years and I've spent untold hours, as has Charlie Locke and John Block, Rob Chapman, we've spent immense amount of time and energy tracking, participating, involving, and learning from that. And it seems a real shame to throw it under the bus. Uh, I can see where maybe some of EC Fiber folks would rather not have any obligation to the city. But indeed, we are the capital city, and we have been a member. And that has definitely played a role in their ability to get tens of millions of dollars in financing. So I don't think we should just step away from that, especially in that we could prevail upon them to help us measure the locations of our poles, map our fiber, get started on a planning process that our new communications union district does not yet know how to do. Uh, there's no prohibition on being members of two. Uh, I have a, I'm a bit puzzled by what I read in the agenda item or in the, on the website today that it appeared to read as if EC Fiber had already approved at their last meeting last week Montpelier's approved motion to withdraw, uh, which hasn't occurred to the best of my knowledge and therefore is, uh, I believe that some of this is uh, based upon some assumptions and some off-the-record communications that are truly the business of the entire council. So uh, there is and has been a pending proposal to investigate use of the fiber on the heat plan to connect the state house. The rest of the state doesn't have the state house. You know, we have the opportunity to provide full motion, high definition video to all of EC Fiber's customers over that fiber. And they don't recognize the value of that yet. But my point is they have engineering and financial expertise and techniques to go out and measure the locations of the poles, pre-engineer, and estimate the costs of building. We are not going to be content with Comcast Fiber. Comcast Fiber will never meet the state goals for speeds that we're supposed to have achieved by 2024. The statutory policy and goals is 100 megabits symmetric by 2024. <coughs> we better get busy writing a plan. And if if the communications union districts, either of them, that we're members of right now, fail to do that, 
I would engage, encourage further involvement by the city council to look at that, look at the statutory goals and policy and look at what needs to happen to get that done. This is the core of our economic growth in the future, is our light speed symmetric communications and Fairpoint and Comcast are not gonna do that for us. And so I think it would be helpful to add some context for the council. I think when this issue came up, it was when we were talking about forming the Central Vermont, uh, I think it's Central Vermont Fiber Internet, Central Vermont Internet. Um, and so I, I, I don't recall there being a particularly strong position from council one way or the other. I think, I think it came up because it was time to make an appointment. No one had come forward at that time to continue serving. We didn't want to reappoint someone who hadn't come forward to continue to be the member. We needed to make one because of a time restriction in the, the, the bylaws of. So right, I think the, the question was put, because we found out very quickly before the council meeting that we needed to re-up someone right. by a certain date. And so we had, the proposal was to re reappoint the existing reps, but then advertise, at least for an interim basis, and then advertise for new reps. And the council said, no, I mean, that was the conclusion, and um, I would add, there's no penalty for having lapsed your rep due to health problems. It's not like you get kicked out because I you didn't send somebody to the meeting. Uh, that pales in comparison to having them vote us out before we voted to get out. <laughs> it's an interesting position to be in. Um, I, I wasn't aware of that. I guess for me at this point, I don't see the harm in staying on. Excuse me, I'm choke. <coughs> I don't, I'm not sure I see the harm in staying on. Do we know is, I mean, so we can make an interim appointment and then advertise for the position? Well, we can, at this point, we don't have appointments, so we could just advertise. Just advertise for the position at the next meeting. and just, and then make the appointment at the, at the next meeting. Do we want to do the next meeting? Because it's Cause two weeks. Oh, it's not for a month. Okay. So I, I think that might make sense then. I, I would offer to continue in or take over John Block's role, but because I'm the alternate for Montpelier on the new district uh, and they have their meetings on the same second Tuesday evening of the week of the month, it would not work. Okay, so if I we would advertise. encourage one of your council members to uh, jump in. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Okay. Great. So we'll take no action on this item and advertise for a new member. Perfect. Uh, I mean, so I don't know, that, unless that's... That, <laughs> well, that, that satisfies me, right? Certainly. Is there any opposition to that plan? I like your plan. All right. We have a plan. Thank you. Okay. Um, moving on, we are now at the DRB appointment. So I see a number of folks who are here in the audience who uh, I recognize their names from applications. So I think what we'll do is give everyone the two minutes to, to introduce yourselves and tell us why you'd like to be on the DRB um, and whatever other relevant information you'd like to share with the council and the public who are watching. Yes. Do you just want to give the context that we made the charter change so we've got to reappoint? Sure. Or we have to Nominated. fully appoint the whole board. Sure. I'll, I'll let you Bill. It's, if you yeah. Want. No, no, no. That's fine. Uh, for, just for general notice, the, the, this past year, as the Councilman Recruiter just referred to, uh, the city amended its charter with regard to both the Development Review Board and the Planning Commission. Um, the Development Review Board specifically was expanded from five to seven members with two alternates, and the Planning Commission was kept the same. But the most substantive change was that the prior charter allowed people to be uh, appointed for specific terms, but didn't allow, um, but it was from the date of appointment. So if, if someone stepped down halfway through a term, someone else took their, their uh, place, then they were then appointed for the full two or three year term as opposed to just completing this ex existing term. So the charter got cleaned up to say, okay, fine, we're gonna, oh, you, can, you can have an interim term, so what we'll do is gonna appoint everybody uh, as of a date certain, so that the, the DRB appointments are all as of May 1st, and the Planning Commission's are, appointments are all of, as of October 1st, and the initial appointments will be for the staggered, you know, some for one, some for two, and then ultimately they'll just circle around and all be done on the same dates. Because that's new, and of course because the, the legislative session didn't end till late June when the statute's passed and signed, this is our first meeting, counting advertising, to make the May 1st 
development review appointment. So therefore, the city council will be appointing the entire board uh, tonight and then selecting which ones go into the various lengths of terms and which ones go into the alternate. That This will be the only time that happens with DRB in future years. It'll only be the couple of members that come up for reappointment. They'll be doing that again with the Planning Commission for October 1, so in, in a September meeting. All right. So um, I, I suppose I'm... I guess if everyone wants to get it, stand, stand and, and wait or come up and in turn or how, however, I'm not sure what the typical process is. We don't usually have so many applicants and so many of them here. All right. Say it, All right, go. Dan. I'm happy to lead off and I'll uh, stand here, set precedent, so I feel comfortable <laughs> setting. They can break precedent. Um, my name is Dan Richardson. Uh, I'm an attorney. Uh, in Montpelier. I live in Montpelier. I've lived here for 18 years. I've been on the DRB since 2007. Uh, <coughs> currently serving as the vice chair. Uh, I've asked to be reappointed to this position uh, because I, first of all, enjoy the work greatly. I think there's a lot of good things that have happened in this community over the past couple of years, and I think the DRB has been a big part of that. Um, what the DRB is and how it functions is really as um, an an applier and, and a quasi-adjudicative body that functions, that takes the, the bylaws and the regulations that the Planning Commission has promulgated, as well as state law, and has put them into application. With very specific factual circumstances, works with applicants. I think we have a very friendly board uh, for applicants. It's not intimidating. Uh, you know, projects come up, we try and work with the applicant, um, and it's a board that works really well together come to consensus decisions to really vet through a lot of issues with the new bylaws. We've been really going through and trying to wrestle with some new precedents um, and trying to set things that will make sense going forward. Um, you know, one thing that I've, I've always tried to do is to make sure that if an applicant comes forward and we make a decision, that the applicant understands why. And that's really an important part of what this board does, is take the abstract and conceptual ideas of zoning um, and applies them to specific factual circumstances and then explains it to the applicant themselves so that if they know, well, you can't do this because you're in a setback. Why do we have a setback? Or what's this issue? Or what are the alternatives? Or what are the issues underlying that? Uh, and that's something I really enjoy and I think I'm, I'm fairly good at and I would hope that uh, I'd have the opportunity to continue to do that. So I, if there's any questions, otherwise I'll sit down because I know there's a line on this. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Anyone else that would like to speak to the council? Mr. Kester? Hi, good evening. I'm Tom Kester, resident on Barry Street. I'm an attorney with Martin & Associates in Barry City. Uh, my practice is primarily focused on real property transactions, disputes, also do contractual business, and, uh, personal injury as well. Uh, I've applied for the DRB because I, I really like uh, real property uh, matters. I really like to help and explain things. That has always been one of my callings with law, has always been to explain and try to <coughs> counsel and help people. And I know that the DRB handles uh, you know, a lot of the issues where people come forward, they want to know, you know, they want to do something, they want to understand, you know, either they can or they cannot. And the DRB has a responsibility to look at the law, look at the, the facts, apply the law, apply the facts, and come to a conclusion that, that is very equitable and, and you know, that, that is a Held ultimately, um, I, I run the whole gamut of real property matters, zoning variances, and the like. I've represented clients in Caledonia, Washington, Orange counties. Uh, I've been in practice now for over three years, and primarily my practice has been focused on real property. Um, you know, if I get appointed to the DRB, sort of my goal is to uh, is to make things um, you know, that the laws have held regulations are upheld and that, um, you know, the, the, the decisions are made in a sort of fair, just, and into a time management manner so that the city uh, can can grow and can uh, uh, prosper. So that's sort of so my goals if I were to be appointed. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. I'm 
Jack Lindley. <coughs> it's a pleasure to see so many young faces. I don't think that's working. I don't think it's working either. Uh, 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 it would be. If is there a switch on it? If there's a DRB meeting, it would be working because it goes home. It's pretty directional. There you go. Yeah, it's working. You don't have control over it? It's, it's, up up it's on. It's on? It's on? It's up all yep. the way. Uh, Just get close to it. Yeah, it's very directional. So. Speak into the mic. Huh? That's right. <laughs> um, I'm Jack Lindley. Um, I have been a resident of Montpelier for 50 years this fall. Um, I've been involved with the DRB in planning for 35 years. And the excitement of seeing new regulations to work under <laughs> um, is a challenge. I uh, certainly welcome that challenge. Some of the other stuff that we worked with was difficult, but uh, and this may be difficult also, but uh, essentially I come from the business community. I am not a lawyer, and we have good discussions with the lawyers on the board, and I enjoy that, and as long as I can still read the fine print, I'm certainly willing to give my time uh, to the city. Thank you, Jack. Good evening, Council. Um, my name is Kevin O'Connell, and I've been a resident of Montpelier for 35 plus years now. And um, most of that time, I've been involved in with one board or another with the city. And it, it's a way that I enjoy giving back something to the city that I think is uh, the best in the in the world. Um, I uh, I have a planning background, and currently on the contracts manager for the health department in Burlington. Um, so I make that 40 mile commute each direction every day. Uh, but I still uh, enjoy putting in the time uh, uh, on the DRB, uh, finding it to be a really great linkage between official living in, in City Hall and uh, what's happening out there in the, uh, in the neighborhoods. So if you have any particular questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, I'm currently a member of the board. I very much like to uh, continue that uh, uh, that tenure. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. You probably don't know me, but uh, I'm new town. I've been here since uh, October. I love Montpelier. Uh, my name's Rob Goodwin. Um, I'm. Uh, Senior land survey technician, uh, technician at a surveying firm. We cover from basically Rutland to uh, the Canadian border. Uh, do not come this far uh, east uh, towards Montpelier, but uh, you know I, I, this is my community. I want to support it uh, with my expertise. Um, I guess in my application, to look at it. I feel like uh, you know the role of a surveyor on the board uh, is certainly uh, uh, you know, beneficial. Uh, there's not many of us uh, out, out here. Uh, I'm not yet licensed as a surveyor. I plan to be by the end of the year. It's a long and rigorous uh, process. I like to explain sometimes that we're not just the guys that have the tripod on the side of the road. We actually go to land records and, <laughs> and uh, you know, are caught right in the middle of uh, disputes sometimes. Um, but um, I think one key component of the survey profession that I like to highlight um, is that um, sort of in the you know land development, we're one of the only people that. Um, don't work for anyone in particular. We work for the, the laws and the, and, the, and the regulations, regardless of whether our client is paying us or not. And uh, sometimes uh, they don't like what we have to say, but we, you know, we look at how things came to be, whether it's easements or property boundaries. And uh, I think I can do the same to apply that to uh, the zoning and planning regulations in Montpelier. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Great. Is there anyone else who has put their name in for consideration to an appointment to the DRB who would like to address the council that hasn't yet? Okay. I'm not seeing anyone. So do we have a motion to go into executive yeah. session? Was that a... Uh, I would move that we go into executive session for the purpose of an appointment. What's the... Sorry, I don't have the language in front of me. I think it's usually for of a municipal official. Yeah. For the purpose of an appointment of a, of several municipal officials. Second. Second. Okay. Jack, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Okay, so we will go into executive session and we will be back. All right, do we have a motion to come out of executive session? I move that we come out of executive session. I'll second. Okay, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those, any opposed? Okay. So uh, I have a minor potential conflict of interest with one of the candidates. I disclosed it to council in executive session, um, and uh, I believe and asserted that it did not affect my judgment in this matter. Um, council agreed. So I'd like to take a moment and thank uh, all of our applicants and our uh, incredible number of well-qualified candidates tonight for all of the DRB positions. Um, I, I'm speaking on behalf of the council, and the council is proud and heartened by the number of uh, qualified and willing folks who stepped up to serve on the DRB. I know these meetings are long and time-consuming, uh, and we appreciate all of the work that you do. Given the recent changes to our zoning ordinances, uh, coupled with the new committee appointment process, the council saw a meaningful opportunity to bring new perspective uh, to this board by bringing in new members while maintaining continuity and institutional knowledge on the DRB. The council would like to extend its sincerest appreciation for all of the work uh, done by those who have been on the DRB for many years, as well as to those who had the courage to apply and step up to serve uh, on the DRB. So at this point, do we have a motion? Um, I move that uh, we appoint to the DRB for a term of three years, Dan Richardson, Kate McCarthy, and Deb Markowitz. For a term of two years, Kevin O'Connell, Ryan Kane, and Thomas Kester. For a term of one year, Robert Goodwin. And to the two alternate positions, Will Shabom and Claire Rock. Do we have a second? Second. Is there any? Uh, all those in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Passes, John. Certainly. So our next agenda item is the Emerald Ash Border Management Plan that we have in draft format. Actually, Councillor uh, Kruger had asked that we take a, a quick break. Is that okay? <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm John Snell, Chair of the Tree Board. I'm John Akulashik on the Tree Board. Jeff Byer, Tree Warden. And uh, we're here to talk about the Emerald Ash Borer. I wish that there were a more pleasant topic to talk about tonight. Um, the last time we were here, we enjoyed talking to you about trees in general. Uh, unfortunately, two or three weeks after that, the first of the emerald ash borers were discovered up near National Life. And John's got a couple little samples for you there. And uh, so the insect's just tiny. It fits on a penny. Um, it's almost impossible to find until you see trees dying. Um, we, these are the two ash trees types that we're dealing with. This is the green ash that's downtown, the big trees downtown. This is a white ash that is mostly the trees that we're finding along streets and roadways and would be on people's property. Um, so they're both very vulnerable to this insect. Um, so in 1913, oh, it was 1913, right? That age is me. In 2013, we were here talking initially about the emerald ash borer, and John uh, developed a, a preparedness plan at that time, which we presented to you. Uh, since then, it has spread to 35 states and three Canadian provinces. So it's everywhere and uh, it now is up at National Life, very close by, and will soon be all over the city. No matter what we do, it, it is here. Uh, the quick rundown of the life cycle is that the adult female uh, lays eggs under the bark of the ash tree. Uh, this Earlier this year, like in June, July, uh, and then uh, the larva develop over the next nine months 
and uh, this time of year would, then would earlier in the summer would break out uh, in a little tiny hole that's impossible to see but in the time that that larva has been under the bark uh, Ashley you have a piece of it there they make these galleries under the bark is this the larva that, that's yes. yeah and those galleries basically girdle the tree they kill the tree slowly but surely and so it all happens pretty quickly. A tree that looks great today in three years could be dead. Um, and uh, I really need to reiterate that this is not a problem with ecology or the insect. It's a human problem. So to the extent that we fit into the ecology of, of life, we're part of the problem. But it, these insects travel less less than a mile a year typically and so <laughs> since it was first found in Detroit roughly 2000 until now it should have only traveled 18 miles but it's in 35 states and it got that way because we cut this firewood and ash is a great firewood and we moved it to 35 states the same problem exists here in Montpelier and we'll talk about that later but we can't stop it, but our goal is to slow it down. So John has been really uh, uh, ambitious about updating our preparedness plan to a management plan, and we're, you have a draft of the executive summary of that, and we're happy to share the whole plan with you as well. Um, but the, the essence of that is that we are facing some pretty devastating uh, consequences. If you walk around downtown, you may notice the big beautiful trees in front of Necky, Down Home, Bethany Church, Bear Pond Books, uh, two on private property, one at the corner of City Center and the other in front of Capitol Theater. All those big trees are green ash. If we do nothing, they will be dead within five years. There are 400 street trees, trees in the right of way. One of the problems with ash is that when it dies, it becomes very brittle and dangerous. It will fall down, it will land on people, cars. So we have 400 potentially uh, hazardous trees. 80 of those trees are bigger than 15 inches in diameter. So they're significant trees. Uh, we also have over 200 trees along the streets, but just outside the right of way that will impact public safety when they die. So we're talking 600 trees that are going to become hazardous and potentially uh, damaging to, to people. In the park, we're, there are also a lot of ash trees. John's done a great job of inventorying these. And there's some 200 trees along the trails and roadways in, the, in Hubbard Park. So again, that's a potential liability. Through our inventory, we looked at a sampling of private property and estimate that there's to over 2,700 trees on private property. Some of these trees are immense. Some of the people in this room have trees this big in their yard, including city manager. Um, when you're going to take it down for me. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to talk to Jeff. Uh, all this is happening so fast that um, we can't really even blink. I mean, we, the, thing, the beauty of this situation is that we have a lot of precedent and a lot of education from other municipalities throughout the country. We can go to their records and see what they did do or didn't do. And I, I, I advisedly put an invoice on your, your place because it is going to be paid one way or the other. And it, we're looking at probably three quarters of a million dollars in 10 years time. There's just no way around it. I wish there were. Um, what, what we think we can do is with concerted effort and, and an investment, we can slow it down so that it doesn't happen in three years or five years, but we can spread it over probably a 10 year period. And that, that, buys, that t buys us a lot of time. Uh, but that's only going to happen with planning, uh, which we're, we're doing a really good job of, and then an investment uh, on your part in more personnel and equipment to help us 
take those trees down as they are dying. Um, what that will do is rather than $750,000 now, we can spread that over time. And I think that it will be much more manageable for all of us in the city. It also gives us as the tree board more time to plant more trees and have them grow. We're, our goal is to plant two trees for every tree that comes down. And in large part, that's because not everyone that we plant is going to live. Uh, and we didn't have enough trees to begin with. So uh, we're hoping to get ahead of that curve. But we also know that in 10 years time, it's, it's going to be in a blink that those trees will barely get us back to where we are today. So we've been working hard, um, and uh, so far we've updated the preparedness plan. John's done a great job of doing that. That really shows us what the next 10 years worth of steps are to take. And these are based on a lot of other communities, so they're proven. Um, we were at a meeting this morning down at BTC where we updated some of those ideas. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. This has been done and improved upon over and over again. And in 10 years, there could be even more information and, and help that we don't can't even envision right now. But from today's point of view, in the next 10 years, all ash trees in the city will be dead, period. Untreated. Untreated, thank you. Yeah, we're going to talk about possible uh, treatment with an insecticide. Um, we've updated our inventory. We did two previous inventories, and there were issues with both of them. We wanted to really find out how many ash trees are there that the city's responsible for. And we're very close to finishing that. Uh, John, again, has done a great job of organizing it, and we're, we're willing to bet a lot on this one, right? Yeah, we've had some help from citizen volunteers uh, surveying streets throughout the city. And we've uh, done estimates on uh, trees that are in the right of way by basically using the right of way tables to determine what trees fall in the right of way and which ones do not. And so I think we've got a pretty good handle on the 400 trees that have been mentioned are very close to what we're dealing with uh, now, maybe a little bit more. It's still, still a few streets to go. And what this will allow us to do is not only know where they are, but we can go back and look at them on a regular basis. Now, you know, we don't have to drive all over guessing. We know where they are. We can assess their condition. And if we see that they become infested with this insect, we can take them down before they become dangerous or do something else. But it, it's really knowing where we're at is a huge step forward. Uh, we have conducted some inspections of suspect trees um, with uh, branch sampling, cutting branches out of the tree and looking closely. You can't spot this thing from the ground. It's impossible. You have to get up there. Uh, we're hoping to have access to the bucket truck on a more regular basis. That's one of the additional costs that we're going to ask you to consider covering. Um, so that we can actually get up right in the tree, do s the proper sampling, and, and know whether the thing's there or not. Right now, there's six trees up at, at National Life. Uh, there's probably more that are infested, but we're not going to know until we get up into them. We're planning to create some trap trees that will draw, next spring, draw the insect to these trees, allow us to not only see what's going on, but to take the, tree, the insects that get in those trees and destroy them before they can spread. We've held meetings with state and national experts, again, including one this morning. So we've done a lot of research, uh, the tree board has, uh, to see what other communities have done. We realize that the capital district is outside our purview, but that it's pretty darn important to the city. So we caused a meeting to happen with the capital district uh, personnel and had two commissioners there. We've met twice with them now, and uh, they're in the process of developing a 50-year plan that will take the hillside behind the, the state house and make sure that it isn't full of just dead trees. Um, so that's pretty exciting, really. It's very forward-thinking. 
we worked with National Life to try and uh, help them figure out how to slow down the spread up there. Right now, that's the only known infestation, and they've been very cooperative, willing to talk to us, uh, listen to us, and, and allow us to stick our big noses in there, basically. We are planning meetings with uh, Greenmount Power uh, and local arborists to include them in the whole thing because this insect doesn't pay any attention to city boundaries. It just goes where it wants to. And we've begun a, a pretty substantial effort to educate the public. What we found is that there's a lot of crazy misinformation out there and it doesn't help anybody to have that out there. There are logical steps that people can take that will reduce their costs, reduce hazards, and help us spread out the infestation over time. And so that's a, a big effort of ours is to get information out regularly and consistently accurately. That said, um, we're volunteers. <laughs> Well, most of us. Some of us are, under, <laughs> some of us are underpaid, right? Um, <laughs> and, and it's very clear to me uh, that we can't keep up with what's going on. We've watched the number of calls coming in, come look at my ash tree, what about this, what about that, go exponentially up over the last couple of months. And it's going to get horrendous soon. So one of the, one of the things we're asking for you to do is to consider making this investment. And it really is an investment. There, I presented you with an invoice, but it's actually an investment that we're asking you to make. And it involves a number of different uh, uh, pieces. Top on the list is we got to get this guy some more personnel and equipment. It is insane to think that the, the parks can do what they're already doing much less what we're about to add on top of them, removing four to 700 trees, many of them dangerous, uh, many of them around you know situations that require great skill and equipment with what they have, one and a half to two people, and broken down equipment. And, and not just focused on trees. We right. have a few, few right. parks. Oh so yeah, you have parks to run too. <laughs> So I, I don't know what that is going to take, but I'm going to push it off to Jeff to let you know in the near future because we need more help. And, and it's not something we can put off. We need somebody in here very soon so that they're up to snuff by next spring ready to, to go at it hard. Um, we, we're hoping that we can work with the city to establish a web address where when people want information or want to report a tree, it can come right in, get dumped in a, in a bucket, and we can access it that way instead of it coming to me or to John or, you know, it just, it's untenable already. We're asking you to consider and approve and fund injection of an insecticide in 15 trees downtown. This is not something I ask lightly. I am uh, have always been an organic farmer. Uh, I don't use pesticides, and yet what I look at is we have an opportunity to save these trees for a 10-year period where we can continue to grow new trees around them, and the only way to do that is to inject an insecticide in them. There are other ways, but they're really horrific. So the only viable way in my mind is to do this. It's reasonably cost effective, about a thousand bucks per year for all 15 trees. It's reasonably safe in terms of the rest of the environment. The pesticide stays in the tree. The leaves when they fall off are not particularly hazardous afterwards for very long, if at all. Uh, there are other insecticides that can be applied that are pretty substantially dangerous to, to pollinators, and we are not recommending those. There may be a few other trees around city or up in the park that we're going to ask you to also approve uh, this process for. But it's a pretty important part of us slowing this down. Uh, what it will allow us to do is to spend 
some more money, which I'm asking you to come up with, we'd like to put in 12 new trees downtown. It's going to cost about 2300 bucks per tree. We have to work with DPW, have the tree well excavated, new sidewalk put in around it, plant the tree, put the grates and guards around it. It's not an insignificant cost. But if we can do that over the next year or two at 2300 bucks a tree and get those trees growing in 10 years time, it'll be much less noticeable that the ash trees are dying. John, your list has $300 and seven trees making $2,100. Your actual paper here, you used a number of 2100 per tree, and, and here you have a different number. Okay, that may be just for the tree itself. Yeah, sorry. The, the draft uh, uh, of the plan that we sent you earlier is already outdated, so we will be updating that. Especially the financial <coughs> Yeah. The financial section really needs a lot of work. Yeah. So we're asking you for uh, funds to treat trees uh, with an insecticide to plant more trees downtown. This is just the downtown area. And we're also asking you to publicly take an advisory stand against using the neonic insecticides that are uh, not uh, not that are very harmful to insect to, to pollinators uh, and I will give you a list of my notes here in just a minute we're asking you to increase the tree board budget from two thousand dollars a year back to five thousand dollars a year where it used to be because we're growing trees that we can plant around the city so not just looking at downtown, but throughout the city. This last spring, we planted about 70 trees. My goal would be to aim for 150 to 200 trees next spring. That's, I don't know how we're going to do it, but you know we need some money to do that uh, and a lot more volunteer labor. We think that there will be a, uh, one of the big problems will be homeowners having an ash tree in their backyard. They don't want to do anything or can't afford to do anything. So the insect gets in there and then spreads to a whole new area. We'd like to be able to have them through education and perhaps a low interest revolving fund have access to funds to take those trees down in a timely fashion. So we're asking you to set aside whatever it takes, 25 to 50,000 bucks to s establish a revolving fund. People can borrow from it if they need to, pay it back when they, you know, on a regular basis, but then, then allows especially low income people to take down trees that we think really need to come down. We're looking to establish some sort of a marshalling yard where we can take all of the wood waste if it's handled properly, it minimizes the further infestation. If it's not, it's going to spread like crazy, as we've seen with firewood. So if we can establish a marshalling yard, uh, we're working with D DPW on where that might be a, a good thing to do, then uh, Jeff's crews can take, uh, you know, can be there to receive the, the logs, could even potentially have a portable sawmill there and train somebody to use it. The wood would be usable if we could debark it and uh, uh, in, in a timely fashion. The rest of it could be chipped, burned. Uh, National Life is going to burn the six, five, six trees that they are chipping up there this week. Uh, so that's a possibility too. And finally, we're asking you to really request of the citizens of Montpelier to obey the published protocols for how to handle and dispose of, of the, the infested wood. That's going to be essential to slowing things down. And without that, it's we're we're you know looking at three to five years versus ten or fifteen. So it's no longer hypothetical. It's here. Um, it's going to be very fast moving, very fast moving. We can't afford to study it any longer. We, we've done all of that. And all of our ash trees that are untreated will be dead in 10 years. Those of you who remember elms, it's far enough back that it's easy to forget what it was like. 
but the pictures out of the Midwest of these ash-lined trees one year and the next year they're all dead. It's sober. So we've learned a lot from these other communities about how to minimize the cost and spread them out over time. And <coughs> we really believe with your support we can do that. At this point, I would entertain any other, any other questions that you might have. Why just 15 trees to be? Downtown? Yes. Well, because you don't want me to take parking places out. I'd love to plant 500 trees downtown. Well, the, but, Talk about treating 15 trees. Uh, oh, treating. Treatment. Why just treating 15? <coughs> That's all. That That's what you have downtown. But, yes, but <coughs> yeah, I could. why not treat some other trees, I guess? Yeah, we're considering question. treating other trees in like Hubbard Park. For instance, if you're familiar with the old shelter, there's a green ash right next to the old shelter. That's one of the favorite locations for the Emerald Ash Board. It is a tree in a sunny location that's a green ash. That tree is, is marked for, for death. So that was one that I would say, yeah, you definitely should be treated. I mean, the idea is to treat it before their oh, signs right. are Yeah, right. now's so, the time to treat so because they're in the area. Yeah. So if it weren't a financial matter, would you opt to treat many, many, many more trees? or? We don't believe there's a lot of street trees that we will be uh, recommending treating. Uh, is, that, is that because of the effectiveness of the treating, or no, no, it's very, effective. very effective. But you have to continue treating it for how long? Ever? Okay. Yeah. So Ever? Forever? Forever? Can, can I can I speak to that just for yeah. a moment? So, so yes, we what you're suggesting is that we pick these 15 trees that are the most visible downtown, right. the the largest, most impressive and treat them for 10 years at least, something like once a year. Yep, no, it's every other year. Every other year. Um, and then as soon as we stop treating them, they will die. We'll, we'll probably take them down the at that point. At that, at yeah. that point. But you'll have had the other trees grow up in the meantime. Right. And so if we did that for every ash tree in <laughs> the city, it would just be. Yeah, yes. yeah. Well, you know, there will, be, there will be private property owners some of whom are in this room that may want to treat their own ash trees. And what we're hoping to do is to educate them so that they use a treatment that is effective and s relatively safe versus one that's not. The real question that I have from the cities, I'm, I'm looking at this and I was like, well, to do 800 trees, you listed a bunch of them here, that's $53,000 a year. If we did all the ones you listed, the 200, you know, but is that is that forever or is that I mean, is it is that, point where this, that number? It was on one of your the list that John the invoice that John gave us said that there were 400 hazardous act. Well, I didn't count the 15. No, but what, how did you arrive at the 53 being for I all the street trees? Because it's based on the diameter of the tree. Right. It's not based on the, the tree itself. It, well, that's what I'm asking. The tree. Yeah the more expensive it is. Well, you had just said it was $1,000 for 15 trees. Based right. on the ones that are there and their sizes. Yeah. So I just took 800 divided by 50. So yeah. can't the, the idea being is if you're talking about, so my question, I don't have, I'm not trying to get yep. an answer. Yep. Right. You, know, you mentioned 750000 that's roughly $75,000 a year. Right. If you could treat those trees for that amount of money, but the, what you're, I'm hearing you say is that they're going to die at the end of it anyway. They will we when we stop, we stop treating, treating them. There are many municipalities who are it treating because it's, at any point. it's less expensive to treat than it is to take it down in many cases. So that, that may be an option. And, and actually, I, I, I am likely to recommend a variation when I have time to get my head above water and that if we, if we only treat 15 trees, we may see wholesale loss in a very short period of time, which make it, makes it very expensive and, right. and overwhelming. Um, so if we treat 100, 150 trees, so that we, we're not getting, having to do 200 trees a year, um, and we carefully select those trees, you know, we may choose to want to save 50 or 70 of them because they're really significant and, and, and really beautiful. And, they, and they're delaying the cost as well. So when we treat, we have options in the future. We can stop treating or we can keep treating. The other thing you should know is that after a certain amount of time, after about three years, you only have to treat every other year, is my understanding. Right. And actually, 
if you stopped in 10 years, you likely wouldn't see any loss for another three years after that. And you might change your mind and say, oh, maybe we should treat again. Because we're dealing with a population of insects that goes like this and then it crashes. Right. As, as after, after 10 is years. This, is there any kind of state strategy on this? Is this is the state strategy. But I mean, they're not funding anything. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong, wrong. No, but we, we met with them this morning and this is exactly what they're talking about. I just wanted to note that I think that the $75,000 a year or $750,000 over 10 years also includes the cost of a lot of other stuff other than just the trees in the right of way. So I'm not sure that that's a equivalent. Right. right. It's also removals. I have a, a just a, sort of a more general policy question, and I so appreciate this is one of my first concerns was what kind of pesticides are we talking about when I heard the state plan sort of talking about right. pesticide options, and I am so heartened to see that you were paying attention to the pollinator issue. So I'm just curious, as a city, do we already have a policy about pesticides We don't pesticides use pesticides and insecticides. at all okay. for, for city stuff. Okay. Bill and I have talked about this, and this is a... Big right. deal. Right. I, I just, I want to make sure that if there is ever a need for a city policy, and maybe this is sort of the event that creates the need for a city policy going forward, that that needs to be our clear and consistent policy about how we are going to deal with pesticides and insecticides. Jack? I read this report, and it's really hard for to speak up. Mm. Uh, you know, as we'll, you know, it'll, this time it'll be like, the elm trees 75 years yeah. ago. It's just terrible. Um, the question, looking at the proposal, it seems like the bulk of the financial investment you're talking about is really removal and replacement of trees, not uh, treatment and maintenance of trees. Right. And so one question I have is, does it really bias much of any significance even treat trees and set up these trap trees as opposed to just putting all of our resources into removal and replacement. Well, the, the problem with removing and replacing downtown is it would just look like a wasteland until we could grow new trees. So we're hoping to plant new trees and grow them until we can get sizable trees. Well, and, and, I, and I, I'm afraid it's slightly more dire in that <laughs> we've been planting quite a number of trees in, in Montpelier, and you'll notice that there's only one kind of tree that's flourishing, and that's the tree that's under attack. Right. Um, so there's a chance in 10 years we will have tried planting a bunch of trees, but I'm, I'm very doubtful that any will ever get to the size and the majesty of the present ash that are in Montpelier. And if we want to have that kind of size tree, um, that we might need to keep treating. And I, I just want to, John talked about it some, but I'd like to talk about it a different way. When you, the size of a tree and its benefits are geometric. Uh, the smaller the tree, it's a very small benefit, but the big tree is, is geometric in, increase in size of its stormwater control, its air filtering, the shade it provides. Um, so it, it's a really a huge value to have uh, a large tree, especially in a downtown <coughs> heated, paved area. The other question I had had to do with uh, trees on, uh, on private property. Uh, have you investigated, does anyone know if uh, the, uh, the death of a tree due to uh, due to infestation like this would uh, qualify the homeowner for uh, a claim under their home <coughs> insurance? <coughs> the insurance companies are already moving in and requiring removal of trees. So I don't know about a claim, but you're going to, you're either going to remove a tree or you're going to have your policy canceled. Or increased, right? Right. Increased substantially. Is that because concern of risk of it falling on and creating a danger? Yeah, Those trees can shatter and, and branches can fall and on, and on your property, all the targets, people? One of the reasons we want to understand where the trees are and be able to monitor their condition is that when they die, they're much harder to take down. A, a, year, a year after they're infected, if you yeah. catch them within a year uh, and, they're, and they're dying, it's, it's not so bad, but if you wait too long, then the, <coughs> then the cost of a larger tree go up, way up. Geometrically? 
Double triple. <laughs> Not quite geometrically, no. but uh, oh, right, in more. a scary fashion. Yeah, yeah, you, you'd, you'd love the interest you could get. They're much more dangerous to take down for the workers, and so they charge you. And a lot more work. work. Do they do it a different way? You know, like my son actually is a tree climber, and yeah. you, you don't. You shouldn't climb it. You, climb you can't it, climb it dead after end. a certain point. You, you're not supposed to climb it. You just have to use yeah, a bucket crane. to do it that way. Yeah. And green then even when you remove branches, they can they can shatter or cause the tree to shatter because the the wood gets that brittle. Okay. That's our understanding. I'm, I haven't done it myself. <laughs> we actually have a world champion climber in the room at the moment. Back here, she. <laughs> Bill, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Come on up to the mic and just... <laughs> Johnny on the spot. Tell about, tell about the climber. My name is Bill Vanji. I'm actually a, a, a champion a tree climber in the world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> currently, I'm ranked 10th in the world. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I actually work for a company called Bioforce, and I do a lot of education about Emerald Ash Borer, and uh, I was at the, this event that the gentlemen were at today, too. So. Um, it's very important that you consider this. It, it will change your community without a doubt. Um, if you speak to any other city council across the United States, across Canada, they are having the same problems and they are all dealing with mass um, short sighted funding because it always catches people in the rear. You know, I, hindsight's always 2020, so it's best to plan. And it looks like your crew did start planning ahead of time. Unfortunately, uh, the implementation is a little bit delayed, so you're going to start to see a lot of dieback. Um, but you guys are doing a great job. So Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Rosie? Um, so I was going to start to wrap up the discussion unless other people have yep. questions, but maybe. Sorry. Uh, one, and I, I understand this may be a premature question, but we were, we were talking about extra personnel. Do you know how many extra personnel? I, yeah, I. There's two, there's two things. There's the economy work, and then we just finished the inventory, and we've been struggling to catch up with what we uncovered in the inventory, and it would be wise of us to be able to catch up and, and not be behind as this comes on, which is almost impossible. Uh, it, it would be, uh, it's hard to imagine doing it without a full-time position, really, to, on it. Right now, we have uh, two people one day a week, which is the two-fifths position. Um, uh, I think we'll be doing a miraculous job if we have a just a one full-time position and then two-fifths to to catch up with what we have and to stay somewhat on top of the uh, issue. Yeah. And sorry, one more. Um, I do appreciate the talk about the uh, pesticides and not using neonicotinoids. Excuse me. Um, I. I'm curious about more details about the pesticides that you are proposing using. Yep. For example, do you have a number like a success rate? Is it? It's 99.9% .9 successful. Uh, and uh, how long it's been in use? Uh, that I'm not sure of, but okay. it's been u utilized widely. Uh, it's the one that the state's recommending yeah. now, too. Okay. Into the tree injection, yeah. Yeah, so there's very limited exposure to people yeah. or animals or whatever. I just did a brief Google search, and it's there's lots of information out yeah. there. Yeah. So we did a lot of research on before the state came out with their recommendations. The tree board actually did research. We parceled out all the different insecticides, and we went in there and did a lot of research, and we came up with the same recommendations that they came up with eventually independently at the same so sort of independently so we're okay. we're pretty pleased with that outcome thank you great any further questions so I just I wanted to express my appreciation for the tree board because I know that often you get to do warm and fuzzy stuff about tree <laughs> appreciation and this is really hard work that you've done on our behalf and I really appreciate that um, and the plan is really thorough and I appreciate that you've brought out all these different aspects of the costs and thought of creative solutions for how to deal with that. Um, so I want to know kind of what you need from us tonight. Um, I, you've made some funding requests, which I am sort of anticipating would be covered in our budget discussions, unless they're immediate funding requests. Um, and then you also wanted some general support. We have to approve the plan, I guess. Well, um, this, this plan, though, because I thought this was just a draft and we were waiting from the state to 
No, we, we can. We, we need to finalize the draft okay. uh, with more details yeah. on the financial aspects. Yeah. Um, but essentially, it's 90% there, and then okay. the money part is something that I'm not very good at, to be honest with you. So that's what we needed to have some help with. So potentially, it could be just a special meeting to approve it if it's done between sometime between now and our next council meeting, because it's not for four weeks. Oh. The, the, the immediate need is having enough uh, bandwidth with this guy so that we can do some further investigations this summer and fall. The next big hit for funding will be in early spring. So I guess the question to the city manager is, well, is there funding available from what we've already budgeted? or <coughs> Well, it depends <laughs> what that number is. I mean, I think probably if we were going to spend, you know, 15000 or whatever that number was to start treating trees the thousand dollars on that certainly we can something we can do we can you would need two thousand because it's every yeah. two years well, so two thousand dollars I mean, that's that's to probably not treat. A challenge but I think uh, we'd have to go through and see you know prioritize and talk and it may be providing you know supplemental personnel or something like that that's gonna be a bigger number especially if we commit to it over a longer period of time but so uh, but I feel the personnel is like needed now and it, it's been needed I, yeah. been saying for a long time we need to invest in our parks with personnel so we need to do our due diligence of where we can find money to support I mean the number you put in here which is reasonable was about 50,000 for half time staff just to dedicate for your ash management um, but we need to look at a solid number for a full time person between what we need already and then to work into the ash management so, so we should come back with a proposal yes. from yeah. with I'd like them to see us for that a recommendation. That. No, I don't think we should yeah. wing it here. But I mean, if they want, if they need, you know, I mean, I could approve the couple thousand dollars to start treating. So. Um, and I also want to remind us that when it comes to working on the trees within the park, that we should absolutely be including the Parks Commission in these discussions and, and working with them closely on that. Um, so. Yes, and I, I would like to see I would like to see the, the getting of the body to help with the work be be something that is a priority because I don't I don't I think we can fund all of this but if we don't have the bodies to execute it's not going to mean anything so I think that's something I think it's pretty safe to say that's a clear commitment from the council to get you the support that you need Wonderful. to make this happen. Okay. One other question you talked about the Parks Commission is that uh, cemetery also affected. It will be. Ash trees there. Yeah, they do. So again, involving the cemetery commission. Yeah. Schools also. Schools, yeah. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. All this information is so helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. I'm going to leave you with one last thing, which is the return on our investment. Because they left you with an invoice initially. <laughs> <laughs> and it really is an investment, and the returns are going to be substantial. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. It's great. Pretty cheeky. Yeah, I love it. I know. I know. I loved that. It was my favorite part. Okay. If I am correct, I believe that takes us to the street closure application uh, that was filed by Union Elementary. I didn't bring an invoice. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so my name's us. what's that? <laughs> For us. For us. School exactly. Board. Different, School board. <laughs> different meeting. Totally different meeting, Bill. Um, so my name's Jay Erickson, and um, uh, I live on Liberty Street here in town, and uh, I'm the project manager for the new playground at Union Elementary School. Um, and we're here tonight specifically to talk about a uh, street closure application that we've submitted. Um, for Park Avenue outside the school. But let me just give you a very, very brief update on where we are with the project, just so, just so we know where we are. Um, 
we went out to bid this spring. Um, we had four interested contractors. We ended up receiving three bids on the first part of June. We've been working with the lowest um, uh, apparent bidder over the last six or so weeks to, um, uh, to bring their bid in line with our budget. The bids that did come in were beyond our budget and beyond what um, was allocated in the bond. And so we've been working on uh, a number of rounds of what we call value engineering, where we're tweaking and looking at changes to the design and the construction process to bring the, the budget in line with where we are. Um, painfully aware of that process. Painfully aware, I know. I don't need to explain it to you, exactly. So um, I guess it was uh, two weeks ago that the um, school board uh, approved, um, it empowered us, by us I mean the district and um, uh, Andrew Lewis is the director, new director of facilities for the district to, um, to negotiate with the bidder who's ECI out of Williston um, uh, at a number of $1.3 million. And so we've been working with them over the, the, the past few weeks to, to bring the um, design and the contract in line so the, those numbers match up and so we can move forward with the project. Um, we are very close by that. I mean, we should have final numbers. We're, we're optimistically hoping that we'll have final, final numbers from them um, this week, and we'll be able to ideally enter into contract with them next week. Um, once we've entered into a contract uh, with ECI, we'll, we will then be able to establish the construction timeline, when we'll start um, and, uh, and how it will phase in and, and happen over the uh, over the coming uh, little over the 13 or 14 months. Ultimately, um, it's the contractor's expertise that we rely on for what that that uh, uh, work process looks like. But what we're working on as as um, as a solid deadline is having the playground done and open again by the start of school um, next fall. So uh, end of. Uh, end of August, beginning of September of 2019. So that's where we are um, in terms of the, the bid process. Okay, we know that there is some variability, and we've heard, we've been talking with the contractor for for a long time about what that schedule might look like. We know there's some variability on their end. What we're what we're doing is preparing to. We want to make sure that we are prepared and that the school is prepared. If the contractor says, we're going to start digging tomorrow, then we're prepared for that because there's a lot of steps that have to happen to make sure that the school is ready to manage the closure of um, the playground for a year. And this is something we've been working on for, well, the project itself over four years, but it's the logistics really over the last year to make sure we have everything in place. So that's, that's the request. The request in front of you tonight is, is around the closure of Park Avenue, which is the one-way street that goes along the main entrance um, of the school. Uh, we are anticipating that the, the playground, will, the entire playground, meaning the upper playground, and if you're familiar with the school also, what we call the lower playground, which is the courtyard that's sort of inside the footprint of the school, will be closed all year. So it's our intention to use Park Avenue, which is that one-way street, as our um, playground and spot for outdoor recess throughout the school year. Now, there's a possibility we may not need it on the first day of school, but it could happen a little bit later in the fall, could happen a little bit later in the winter, um, could ha even happen in the spring, but we want to be prepared so that um, uh, if, if when the contract is ready, when we know the construction process is going to start, that we're ready. The school obviously has to do a lot of planning <laughs> around recess, um, certainly around safety procedures, fire drills, and all of that. So we, 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 it's our intention, and we, we will have all of those things in place by the beginning of the school year. So what you the map that you all have received is is a is is in the in the application is the plan that that we i say we collectively have put together to sort of be able to use park avenue um, as that playground and minimize the impact on the surrounding neighborhood and by we i mean it uh, I've been working on it. Um, Andrew, the new director, uh, has been working on it. We've we've had a lot excellent conversations with Bill, with with um, with with Bob, and with Tom, with the fire, with fire, with police, with Tony from police, and with Tom. Um, 
Public Works as well as Chris, uh, the building inspector, to make sure everything we're doing is focusing on minimizing the impact to the neighborhood, but also certainly making sure that what we're doing is, is as safe as possible for, for all the kids. We're talking about 450 kids a day that use this outside space. At any one time, you could have between 75 and 125 of them outside at one time. So being able to, assuming that, we ha that the playground is completely closed and off limits, being able to utilize Park Avenue as that outdoor space, which is actually fairly significant square footage and, 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 and pretty nice, will, will really help us um, be able to you know, make sure that the kids are having adequate time outside um, and having outdoor space that they can learn and, and that it, it's safe. So um, one of, I, I'm happy to take any questions, but I guess what I can do is sort of run through the map as to what we're thinking, or you can let me know where you'd like me to start. In the application, you said you've had community meetings. We have. I'm still, I didn't hear, I didn't read what the neighbors were saying. How are they going to get to their house if the street is closed off? Well, fortunately, uh, as the as the um, the closure works, ultimately, um, what we, we would be restricting access to three off street parking spots, and that's all. So what we're talking and driveways access to their homes. Not, not, not even not, so we're, we're, we're not limiting access to driveways, um, and I'll go through the details of how that works. Um, but there, there are three off street parking spots that are associated with the the gray apartment building that's on the corner of Park and Loomis, um, and so access to those would be restricted. But but that's all. And, and let me explain to you why, and then I can kind of run through some of the details. So what we're proposing is that we put a. Um, uh, a fence, a chain link fence, at the end of Park Ave where it meets Loomis, okay? Um, and then also a, about just just a touch over halfway up Park Avenue, just below where the kind of driveway access to the school is, kind of where the bike racks are, if you're familiar with this school, okay? Um, so to your point, Donna, fortunately, there are, there are three residential properties all of which would have access to the driveways above that um, that upper fence. I'll call it the upper fence. It's right right at the point where it starts to climb is is where we would stop it. So um, 12, 10, and then also 8 Park Avenue would also have access. 8 Park Avenue has a horseshoe driveway, so they would have access to one side and. And, but not the other, but they would still, so would the oil company, you know, do delivery, so would FedEx, so would UPS, I mean, it would all, there would, there would still be access there. To, um, to, just to clarify in that, the, the thinking we talked about was that that top section of the street would become two-way yeah. during the interim period, just so people could get in and out because the rest of the street would be closed. Yeah, good. So for the residences, for the, yeah, to access, to access the, um, the driveways and then also would provide an opportunity for the um, construction to be able to access the upper part of the playground there, where the, where the existing fire lane. Um, oh, noise, sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah, and the, other, and the other significant piece of that is that, um, that, I call it the driveway, but that access point on the corner where the bike racks are is the ADA accessible um, point for the school. So the, the bus that, that brings kids who um, need, that, need that service um, can still come down there, drop off, turn around, and go back up. And we would also be providing a, um, uh, a handicapped parking spot uh, on uh, Park Avenue there. So yeah, but Bill said that the, the, the fact that that would then become two-way is, is significant. Yeah. Uh, so I noticed that Jack has a question, but I also wanted to, I see some members of the community here, and I just, I also wanted to open it up for any community comments, yeah. if there are any folks here who, who want to be heard on this matter, too. Absolutely. Seeing anyone jump in the hot seat, so. But absolutely, yeah. But so then it's the two Park Avenue, that's two or three parking spaces there, those are going to be eliminated for the duration. So, so those would be, and um, I went and spoke to the property owner, um, John Baker, and he, he occupies one of those spots and then one of his tenants has the other two. And, and I, I spoke to them. Um, part, 
and they were very um, uh, flexible and, and positive in terms of a conversation and how could we make it work together. Um, and I, and I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, what part of the proposal, if you look at number five there, which is basically the green line along Loomis Avenue, is that we would take the three spots that are on Loomis at the end of that building and designate them specifically for those two tenants. And we're, we were, we're still like, we need clarification from the police department on how, whether we would do a permit or how exactly we would um, enforce that. But that those, those three spots that are cornered to park up to the driveway of that building, where we see the green line and the number five there, would, those three spots would be for those two tenants. Um, and so which would, um, you know, provide them, provide them access. That sidewalk will remain open. So they would still, there was, there would never, that would never be blocked. So they'd still be able to walk. But one piece of information that I'm still trying to uh, finalize is providing um, one off street parking spot for, for John's tenant. Um, John, Thankfully, he spends the winter in Florida, and he was actually relieved that he wouldn't actually have to pay somebody to pile those spots over the winter. Um, he would just leave his car there. But, but it, we do want to make sure that we have off-street parking for when there's um, parking bans in effect. And so I'm working with a couple other property owners in the immediate vicinity to find one or two lease spots that the school would lease for them to use um, if they needed overnight parking or if, they, uh, or if there was a parking ban in effect. Yep. Any comment? Hi, I'm Jeff Prescott. I live at 10 Park Avenue. Um, Andrew Shuford and I own 10 Park Avenue and 8 Park Avenue. And we have had meetings with uh, representatives from the school. Um, they have acted on our feedback about access to the properties. So, you know, just wanted to let you know that we are here. We actually had our own executive session when you were gone for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> got confirmation on a lot of things. We were happy to provide that so, service. For you. <laughs> so you know, you know, we appreciate the school working with us, and you know, it, it's going to be disruptive. But you know, we our feedback has been considered in what's being proposed to you tonight. Thank you. So I I have a couple of questions. Um, I am I am willing to support this with, I just have a few questions about whether or not the traffic flow disruption, so I happen to live on on that portion of East State Street where this is my sort of workaround to avoiding downtown traffic. <laughs> um, and, I, you know, I, that's totally fine. Yep. Um, but obviously there's going to be a disruption to the other parts of that neighborhood because we're going to have to go further down and then, you know, go further up. Yep. And I know that right now, I know it's road construction season. It's like a special season here in Montpelier. Um, and so there are just a lot of cones out and things like that. I want to make sure that that is going to be all taken care of so that you actually can get two vehicles on Liberty Street to, to be able to pass because the last time I drove it, which was last late last week, that was not doable. So that's one of my questions. Um, ha has the traffic disruption and or traffic flow disruption been sort of spoken about with Liberty Street and other surrounding streets? You mean will the construction be completed? Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's just it's, it's, gonna, to, it's yeah. gonna impact yeah. other streets. Yeah. And so I just wanna make Absolutely. sure that those residents were sort of made aware that their street that's usually not as. So our, um, any of our work plans within a school zone, we try to wrap up before school opens. So that's also true for Liberty Street. Okay. Um, so any of that work, paving's actually scheduled. Um, we've got some side work, sidewalk work to do on Liberty, but we'll be done and out of there before school is open and before this closure plan goes in place. So Liberty will be done. Liberty okay. Street will be done. And will neighbors? And, we'll and will will the folks up there? Other than this meeting, like, have they sort have has anything gone out to them that hey, this is coming? You can it's likely to that you could anticipate more traffic because that's a pretty well used shortcut. We provided a uh, mailing list for for uh, blanketed that neighbor. But okay. That was a while ago. I'm not sure. Yeah, we've done a couple. We've done a couple community okay. forums. We this is why we were developing this plan. So, I mean, there, now that we're getting close to finalizing, then there will be, um, 
some small as we finalize some of these smaller details we'll, we'll then go back out to to the folks in that immediate vicinity mm -hmm. but to to say this is sort of what's where we're at and what what we've decided and yeah. I think the other piece is um, I know that some of the parking spots right now are sort of all day parking. The proposal is to make them two hour parking. Um, I'm curious about the impact to the library. So I'm assuming that the library has been part of the discussion just because that whole sort of area is used for parking for library patrons. Um, and then that sort of disruption from the all day parking to, to two hour parking. So what, yeah, what we were proposing is that typically where the where the buses tr have traditionally dropped off and picked up right in front of the school um, has been two hour parking during the school day um, so that folks who are coming to meet with teachers or administrators or whatever it might be could come visit the school um, and then leave. So yes, what we're proposing is that the, the two spots basically at the junction of School Street and Loomis, it, it's four total spots of the junction of School Street and Loomis um, would become that two hour parking so that parents could come there, be able to park and then leave. Um, so honestly, we have not been in touch with the library because, because of the distance down School Street to how that would impact. I think that from personal experience and, and anecdotally, as we put the plan together, we, we find that folks that use those spots tend to be more folks who are there um, parking there all day because they're working in town as opposed to just visiting the library. Um, so yeah, there certainly will be an impact. There, there's no doubt because it's pushing those spots off of park, you know, a little bit more into the neighborhood. We realize that, but it is also critical that parents and and other folks within the district who are coming to meet with the administration or or to meet with teachers have a place that they can, um, on a temporary basis, park during the day. So that, you know, that would just be um, essentially during the school hours, it, going a little bit beyond to five o'clock to help accommodate the pickup that happens for the preschool and after school programs that run three to five. So that's why that, that the timing of that extends a little bit beyond the typical 250 end of the school day. And, and again, I totally under, I just want to make sure, because there's people who are listening who haven't had a chance to read all of these, so I just sure. want everyone to sort of be in the know that that change is Absolutely. likely going to happen. Yep. Um, and we've, I, I will say, dude, we've, reached out, we've reached out to the folks um, uh, at the corner of uh, both those corners uh, about the plan, so they're aware of the changes that are coming. Yeah. Um, I think that was all I had. I had one more, but I forgot what it was, so. I wanted to make a point. Um, the uh, the plan is uh, beyond just a a not just a street closure, but there are um, other aspects of it involving ordinance and, and, and the need to enforce. And I'm not real clear. Um, on, it also involves some parking restrictions at the corner of Liberty and Loomis. Uh, I'm not sure which note that is, but it regards the ability of buses to maneuver that tight corner. Um, and so that they can go to uh, a revised, um, a temporary uh, bus location plan for Hubbard Street uh, so they can maneuver up there. So all of those, including altering one section of the street from a one-way to two-way, which is currently under ordinance, um, we would bag or remove the sign. Um, all of those uh, would need to be enforced and would need the authority of the city council to do that. Typically, ordinance changes require um, a two public hearings and then a 30-day warning appeal period. I'm really not clear how it works for temporary um, closures and whether we have clarity on, on what authority the city council can do under street closure um, for a short-term period. By the time we go through that hearing process, we'll be into the fall, typically. That. So, is there any any leeway in how that works? But the two-hour permits, the tenant parking, whether that's permit uh, passes or what, um, you've got to put signs out there, and they need to be enforced and, and legally stand up. So, something we need to resolve. Okay, and so I guess that's my sort of. Did you have a question? I just wanted to go away. Oh, okay, um, I was going to say. So it sounds like 
we are not at a point where council can approve this yet because there's ordinance stuff that needs so to be addressed. My suggestion would be that you approve the street closure and you approve the plan and direct staff to sort of take all the steps to put whatever is in place to follow up because the school needs to be able to plan on this, that this is what's going to happen and, and we will get, uh, you know, the police department does have some leeway with emergency actions they can take to just block parking and do things for short periods of time. Uh, and I know when we talked about that, they felt pretty comfortable with that. But for, you know, for a period of time, um, you know, we can have stuff for the next meeting for first reading. Um, so I, I think... If there's an expedited process, I, but that would be the preferred I way think, to go I to think, improve the closure. I mean, obviously, if you don't favor it, that's one thing. But if you're, if you're on board with the general direction, I think the school needs to know as soon as possible tonight that this is that this this plan is okay subject to fall us sort of following the staff legal implementation steps because they've got to communicate with parents schools you know next august 22nd is going to be you know a week before school starts and uh, Donna, well, hubbard street is a problem teachers park their cars there you add snow and it's and it's very bad so i was wanting Tom's opinion, but you can work it out in the staff. Mm -hmm. That that really needs to be considered whether or not that those people can still park there. It's a tight think, squeeze to come around and yeah. increasing the two way from the neighborhood. I think it may be need to consider removing the parking. I think that's actually one of the. I, I had that very same question, and I, I, it caught my eye somewhere. It was one of the uh, the requests. I think it's number three. No parking for 150 feet above the crosswalk on the school side of Hubbard Street. They, they have the upper part. They don't have the lower part next to Loomis. It's oh, that. Oh, okay. Pull, when you pull off of Liberty on Hubbard, it's a squeeze. It's this, right. Yeah. It's really. I have to back up several times and let people to come through. Anyway. So it, it is a squeeze all the way through, and I think one of the things that you struggle with is you know, you're already displacing a bunch of parkers, and if we restrict, you know, it's it's been the same squeeze that people have had. It's not we're not just sort of adding to the squeeze, and, and the only traffic that's going to be coming in and out is going to be from those homes. I mean, it's no longer going to be a through street, so you you're actually probably reducing a lot of the traffic coming off of park that has been coming there, you're really only talking about the, the three driveways and the construction people. We oh, talked about yes. putting a bus a, a bus stop at the top of Hubbard, but yeah, I mean, sure, from, from width and snow, it would be ideal to ban the parking the length of Hubbard there, but then you've, where do you, where do you put them? Yeah. So, um, I think from this um, exercise, reviewing all of the options and a number of things were considered, um, we always find seems in our ordinances that there's some housekeeping be done but what we noticed is that um, the south or westerly side of Hubbard Street between um, Liberty and Park Avenue there's no restrictions so you can park on both sides even as narrow as it can be with a car parked on one side there's not enough room here and then um, sorry they're with their names, but um, they pointed out that we are uh, missing a stop sign, which is odd for the one-way section of, of um, Park Avenue. For some reason, that's been that way for years. People I just thought it was like you hill. were just going. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a go hill, so I think it's because of snow, I presume. Yeah, it's but a go hill. Yeah, it but is a go hill. So <laughs> we've stopped traffic going uh, uh, eastbound, but there's no stop sign going westbound. So, but. Um, I think that the, the snow removal is, is an issue always anyway. Um, we, that is our, one of our priority areas for snow removal. It's one of the first areas. The downtown and the schools um, have snow removals first. Wait, um, before the snow removal. Yeah, with, with just because it's a very narrow street. Um, but I think we can respond to that. You probably have noticed throughout the winter we'll post no parking signs temporary no parking that's done under police authority. So we'll do that until we can get the snow bags removed. Jack? I, if it's an appropriate time, I will approve of this plan with, as the manager said, direction to staff to uh, 
take the uh, implementation steps necessary to bring it back to the council as the necessary. Do we have a second for that? Second. Any further discussion, Connor? Yeah, this might be uh, overboard, but I might recuse myself from this in my uh, professional capacity. I represent the teachers and education support professionals in Montpelier. Parking would be a working condition. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's best to stay clear. I think I know where this is going. <laughs> okay. All right, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? I, I assume it would be an would it be an abstention? Yeah. Okay. All right. The motion carries. Thank you. Okay. I just want to do a check in. Does council feel like they I want like they a two minute break to handle anything, or we're good? Voted. No, she doesn't. There's four of us. Said of just fluids. Right. I you right. Does anybody need a bio break of or anything? Just. Okay. Let's take like two minutes, and then we'll come back. Next up, Parklet Ordinance Discussion. Okay, so, I was gonna say, all right, so this is not a first reading, this is for council discussion. Exactly. So, um, right, uh, we, had, we had discussion about the Parklet Ordinance with the one time we used it. This spring, people expressed opinions, Jack had drafted up some ideas, and so the thought here was simply write out an example of what, I, what we heard from you and get some sense of what you want to do, what you like, what you don't like, and take it from there and work on it or refer it to a committee or do whatever you'd like. And if I can say one thing, um, in, the, uh, in the ordinances drafted, and I exchanged emails with Bill about this, there's one change that I would have incorporated that isn't in here, which is under uh, section 20-4, the, the second sentence says applications will be handed up, handled on a first come basis. Oh, right. And I would delete that because we have a my, time frame. my purpose for this whole thing was to give us the opportunity to evaluate all the applications at one time and say yes or no to those that we, in our judgment, meet our standards. I would agree with that, Jack. Well, and I think we're changing the way that it works, so it's less of a rolling process and more of a, you may apply during this period. So anyone who, as long as you get your application in, it will be, I think we should still look at the, right, because if we get a whole bunch of applications that we agree with, you know, and, and the ones that, you know, whatever, people who got their applications in first, in considering all of the other factors should be looked at, but. Um, there was one thing, let's see. Um, so it's in section 20-7. And um, what I am struggling with, it talks about how the city council is the only body with the authority to terminate. Um, but what, um, what does that procedure look like? Does that look like, like a hearing that we've done for eminent domain? Or does that look like a hearing like we did to determine the, the land disputes? I just want to make sure that the, that the expectations are clear for everyone in that and, and I understand we want to have the ability to um, have these termination hearings I just want to make sure that everyone understands what the, the due process the procedural due process there looks like so tempted to write that in but <clears throat> certainly could be improved if the council wishes uh, we talked about may terminate um, based on you know violation of the ordinances or improper use or negative impact it could only occur after following a public hearing at a regularly warned council meeting. Council provide a 15-day notice of the hearing to the applicant, and the notice will include the provincial, potential reasons for termination. But so in yeah. terms of what they can expect here, like are they able to 
introduce evidence like so so, so how will we conduct right, it exactly that's what i really want and i think it should be the same process that we would have for similar things so i guess the question is do we want to say that this will be a a qu quasi -judicial. quasi judicial or is this simply a you know you come to your council we'll have a pub you, we're going to conduct a public hearing we'll listen to your reasons and and um, my other question in in that is so so I think that's one thing to chew on the other question is they're required to pay for those parking spaces in advance mm -hmm. um, and I I think if we if we terminate we would refund okay but that's not spelled out a, right. in there And then the only other question that I would have, and I think that I know the answer, but I don't like to assume things because we all know that nothing good happens with that. Um, so uh, assuming that for some reason we have a termination proceeding and we terminate, and then the parklet owner or you know whomever is responsible for it does not uh, abate during the period, my assumption is that that would then turn into a nuisance action um, but I'm not clear that our ordinance allows for that, so I would like to, I think we need to specify what additional remedial actions will occur if uh, the, you know, if these are not complied with. Um, right, so the, the existing ordinance, not the proposed new, says the city reserves the right to take legal action to recover costs if applicant fails to remove and the city must handle removal. And I think up above it talked about if there's an emergency, the city reserves the right to remove on its own. But, what, I mean, what I'm saying is right. it, it just seems like we could tighten that up by basically utilizing the same process by which we would approach a, a nuisance mm -hmm. claim. And I, if the goal is to sort of streamline all of these things and make them all oh, yeah. work, I'm not um, defending this. Together. I'm just <coughs> the other, I apologize for monopolizing, but this is the, like, this is, I didn't realize that this stuff could be fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is like the stuff you learn in law school and you're like, who does this? Um, the other oh, question that I had was about, um, oh, it's gone. Okay, that was a lot of buildup. <laughs> Uh, I have a couple, so maybe you can get it back. Um, I like the way this is going generally. Uh, I have one small um, correction here. Sorry. Mike. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. Didn't didn't catch that. Uh, one small correction between sections 20-4 and 20-5. Uh, there's a discrepancy of dates, um, and it looks to me like we probably want the applications to be due right. February 1st. And so mm -hmm. in section 20-5, uh, yeah. March. Yeah. between November 8th and February 1st, not March 1st. That's March. Yeah, and uh, I'd like to speak to that. I mean, this is, so that's a good catch on the dates. But Jack had suggested, and there was a lot of logic to it, that you, know, you have applications due by March 1, staff reviews by April 1, council makes a decision by May 1, and then May 1 is when you can put I think our concern was that there was, if there were a number of applications, we had sufficient time to review them all and also making sure we built in sufficient notice. One of the things that we heard about was, um, so this is nothing, it's your comment, this is just in general about this sequence of time, was that we built in enough time to make sure there was adequate notice for people to come to comment about these things and that, um, so we, that's why we backed it up to February 1 to try to allow a little bit more time. But you're right, those, those sections should be but I wanted to point that out in case people had different feelings about that sequence of time. Um, I think it should be February. Um, I remembered my thing. I don't want to monopolize, though. So Go ahead. There's... Okay. Go ahead. Um, restorative justice is one of the things that we, as a city policy, have said needs to become part of our ordinances. And so I'm wondering if pre-termination hearing that we would require attempts at remediation through our community justice center um, as, as a means to try to address the, uh, the ordinance issues or, or whatever that might be. That's one of my Great idea. So um, I am really happy with a lot of these changes. I was, had 
significant concerns about the original ordinance and the rest of the council worked with me to, to address a lot of those. Um, but I really appreciate Jack kind of taking this a step further and, um, and making this better. Um, one thing I wanted to raise um, is that, you know, I've had um, some concerns about uh, how we, after we've awarded a, a parklet, um, if it's not being used particularly well, how do we know, do we have any way of dealing with that? Because once we award it, it's, you know, for a period of time, and, um, and I think that part of that's addressed in all this pre-process, so the, the action of awarding the parklet is a lot more deliberate. Um, but I think another piece of that is in the business owner's business plan, you know, they, if they need to pay for the parklet, then they're going to ensure that this is something that will be utilized. And I'm speaking here particularly about private parklets that are limited to a business's use rather than public parklets that are, that are available for everyone. Um, and so the previous council did not have any appetite for setting a higher rate for uh, private parklets. Um, but I just wanted to raise that as that's another thing we could consider um, in terms of incentivizing uh, private parklet owners to really ensure that the space is well used is charging a little bit more. Um, and then people wouldn't kind of uh, <laughs> go through, through this process lightly um, and would make sure that they had a, a plan to make it utilized. So um, wanted to throw that out there. There wasn't support last time around, so if there's not support this time, then I, I won't push it, but just a thought. I, I'd like to respond just in brief. I, Mayor Watson had mentioned something about how parklets are paid for or, or something about that. I cannot, I cannot remember what she had mentioned to me. It was sort of in a, in a big conversation about lots of issues. Um, I remember that there was a conversation about it. So more for Bill, what is the process by which, like, if there is some sort of suggestion like that, I know this is slated for a next, for a, for a first public hearing at our next Slated for meeting. whenever you want to set it. Okay. <laughs> I just no, want to make there's sure. There's no time frame. Anne I mean. had some really thoughtful ideas about ways that we could sort of work on this ordinance a little bit, and I want to make sure that we get some some input from her other right. than anything that she yeah. may have chatted with you about already. Yeah, no, about. there's no schedule to this. I mean, this is, I mean, I would say, in a perfect world, we'd want this approved by November 1 when it's time to <laughs> yes. start, but there's no major about this. We just, it seemed like a good time to have this conversation. We didn't have, um, so currently it's, it, we just, it's what the parking rate is per parking spot. So if you have two or three, you pay that rate, you know, for the amount of time. Um, you know, one, uh, so, and they're supposed to be, um, it's supposed to be paid prior to the construction or installation or operation. So presumably they couldn't put them out or I suppose if somebody was in arrears, we could not allow it to go out the next, you know, we could pull their permit. That could be a reason for termination, I guess, because it says any violation of this ordinance. Um, but I think the question Councilmember Kruger is raising is, is that enough? Is that, you know, is, is that enough? Could somebody put it out there and just not have anybody use them? Is that okay? Or is, if, if, if the whole idea of a private parklet is to have more business, make sure they're getting enough business. Now, we did also put in here the explicit, uh, I think it was implied before, but I tried to write in um, the explicit requirement that these had to be available to the public during any non-business hours, just to be clear about that, so. Yeah, and to that point, if I can, another <coughs> of my suggestions, um, because I like the idea of the private parklets being open to the public as they are outside of business hours. Um, and I think that we could make a little bit more of that. For example, requiring simple signage on the parklet saying, uh, you know, the city of Montpelier and such, and, and this business uh, welcome you to this parklet, restricted to business use during business hours and open for public use outside business hours. Um, part of that is because I, at least in public, I will not sit down in a place that I think might be private, um, and I think there are other people like me, and I don't want to, uh, you know, I want to encourage them, sit down. Um, one other point I want to uh, suggest we look at in here is under, um, 
lost the section, but there is a, a point that requires, um, here we are, at the bottom of section 20-6, Parklets may be used as an accessory space for nearby businesses, but they may not be used as a standalone place of business. I'd like to revisit that, um, if only for discussion. I think that um, especially, for example, if we boost the cost for uh, private parklets, a one or two space parklet might be uh, an kind of a neat thing for one of the, the pop-ups that happen occasionally in town. Like, for example, Tremolo Coffee that uh, popped up in the front gallery where I uh, am involved. Um, I understand that there are almost certainly going to be issues of, you know, competition with existing storefront businesses and so on. And I would not want to, for example, block a coffee shop with a coffee pop-up. But I think that there's some amount of process built into this that we could, you know, keep an eye on that and, and allow short-term uh, independent business pop-ups uh, into this possibility. I'd, I'd be happy to hear arguments about that. Donna. I'll weigh in. I feel that we have a license process for vendors, and that's an appropriate place. But a parklet is a capital investment that we want to see used. I don't think it should be competing from people who are paying property tax. And it's a whole different establishment versus a vendor, and I like to keep them separate. Any, Connor? Yeah, I'm not, it wasn't here when it was originally drafted, but I, I wasn't quite sure how the three years number was arrived at. I know it's a substantial investment for a business or anybody else setting up a parklet, but personally I'd be a little more comfortable with maybe bumping it down to two years. So I would just throw that out there for a think. Three years seems like an eternity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so to both of those points, uh, when the, when this was originally crafted, the, the the conflict between vendor and regular was the reason why the no it was intended to not compete with existing businesses but be supplement. And the three years I think really was just a recognition that if somebody's going to spend ten thousand dollars to build a, a parklet, that if they're only going to have them there for one or two summers, it might not be you know might, the, the council wanted to encourage these to happen, and um, they were. Con concerned that if they didn't make it attractive enough that um, it would people wouldn't do it now I think you know, perhaps you know the pendulum may have swung a little people want to do them and it might be less of a disincentive I don't know and I, I don't know if you know certainly the one we had before the positive pie parklet was a very substantial structure it can be picked up and moved and it's you know I think I don't know if the the down home one is, is is built the same way and cost you know I don't know how much it costs to build that one I'm wondering if we did up to three years so if there were folks who only wanted you know they, if they wanted to try it as a as a first time thing and and they could check a box on the application how many years are you seeking and you know for for the you know maybe the, the two I think this would limit them at two spots um, anyway right but you know, maybe maybe for those they might want the three year, but if someone just wants to try like a one spot thing and they want to see how it goes, that, maybe that that might address. Yeah, I, I'd be a little more comfortable with that, especially if we're picking and choosing. You know. It's sure. So up to three years. Jack. Mm -hmm. I since I'm kind of the moving part here, I'd be happy to sit down with the mayor and you know, catch up. Sure. with the conversation you had with her to see what her ideas are, what we might change or yeah. otherwise propose. She had some really good thoughts about it, so. So, all right. it sounds like we're all generally wanting to move forward with some of these changes, so I think that's kind of what you needed from us tonight, mm -hmm. Bill. So I would move that we set a first read, we direct city staff to continue uh, crafting amendments to the Parklet Ordinance and set the first reading for August 22nd. We have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 
Any and I think it, and I just think as a practical process matter, we'll probably do a set up a meeting with Jack and the mayor and I, and we'll since we're the prime drafters and go through this and yeah. and just so that everyone's clear that we're not working behind anyone's back. So I just want to make sure were there any abstentions? No. Okay. And just I've got the yeah I think I've got the notes here. We talked about the up up to three years, the changing the date. We talked about the pre-termination res restorative process in general. What's the hearing process? A refund if terminated. How is removal handled? And a signage noticing public use. Great. So we are on to the second public hearing on the revision to Article Nine of the City Ordinances for business licenses. So this is a public hearing, so I will open up the public hearing. Turn it to them. Want me to fly through here uh, really quick, just going back to it again. This involves the uh, repealing of a couple licenses that were mistakenly left there that should have been repealed a long time ago. And the other repeals listed in the individual sections as opposed to the article are all repeals of individual references uh, of license fees hardwired into the ordinance. And that's then coupled with an amendment, a change to section 9.2, which is a strike all and replacing with a license fee schedule shall be approved annually by the city council. I, to get a schedule out to you all, I'm sorry, I, I didn't until today, I apologize. Uh, it's the one that's on the website right now. Um, a couple other things I might suggest in a final product, or I would suggest, as long as we're cleaning up, is under Article 9, dry cleaners. It still contains the provision demanding that um, folks who are, uh, live outside town who want to bring their dry cleaners into town have to get a license from me. So that would be Section 9902, out-of-town businesses. Um, like their clothes? It says, no non-resident person or corporation shall enter the city limits to deliver or pick up clothes or other items to be dry cleaned until he shall first have obtained a license, <laughs> therefore, as required. So I'm, I think that. So I assume it means the people that yeah. pick up and take out, not the individuals, but that the way it's, it's written. Like. So there's that one. There's <laughs> also the um, <laughs> section 9-2, which has the strike all with the license fee. Um, part of the intention when um, Councilor Galanka brought that up as he wanted to get rid of this business of a half, which, you know, makes sense. I'm going to charge people $17.50 if they do something after September and nobody starts a vendor after September. Um, but just to make it all make sense to strike out the fraction of from the title of that section. So instead of fee for fraction of license year, we just say fee for license year. And the last thing I would suggest adding in, and this one you may or may not want to do, the practice I inherited um, when, for uh, anyone setting up a vendor test type thing, like they do it over at the church a lot, at, you know, next to the farmer's market, uh, is that if it's private property, it's private business. Uh, this has a, this has a, uh, uh, what is it, section 91403, designated locations, has a provision that if the area is, involves private property, written approval from the owner has to be presented and, uh, and details with the spaces clearly defined. So, I mean, I would suggest we strike in th this sentence. So instead of saying, if the area involves private property, written approval from the property owner shall be submitted for use of the location for vending with space limitations clearly defined, to if the area involves private property, um, approval from the property owner shall be required. So I have a procedural question, though. Can we, since those weren't part of what was included for the second public hearing, can we still do those? Or that's a, I would read that as a separate. You can make amendments at second reading. I mean, we definitely yeah, done that before. Can. And they were rather last minute. It was when I was putting together that fee schedule that I didn't get to you. I'm like, oh, look at this. And I think the reason for the fee schedule was we wanted to make sure we adopted that fee schedule at the same time so that we have continuity. Right. 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 So I would move that we, I guess, we need to close the hearing? I, I, is that how, is that how we do it? Close okay. the hearing first. So, so I will now close the public hearing absent objection. Okay. We have a motion. Um, I would move that we adopt the uh, changes the amendments suggested by the clerk um, as well as the uh, amendments uh, included in the agenda um, and simultaneously adopt the fee schedule 
uh, which you, John, you said is posted on the website? Yeah. Um, fee schedule proposed by the city clerk. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. All right. Thank you. So let's see. Been driving me crazy. We are now at the ice rink. Ice rink. Uh, I left on your desks some a copy of photos of what I'm about to talk about. So does everybody have that? And I'll be quick because I think most of you know the background of what's going on here. But generally, um, for the past two winters, we've had a pilot rink that's been run by a private group called Put a Rink on It. Montpelier Live has assisted with that, and the city's assisted with that more as a personnel. We've just sort of assisted with personnel. The private fundraising uh, cannot continue and won't continue. It, it's, it's pretty difficult. And the state has asked us to come up with a better proposal for a better design for a rink. Uh, I call it a permanent rink, but it's actually just a seasonal rink. It's just that we would keep it, and it would be owned by the city. It would be run by the rec department. Um, the key to what is happening here is the city is taking on the ice rink, basically. It's not going to be a privately run fund, you know, through private fundraising. The city will take it on. The big expenses are up front just in purchasing the material and getting it built. And that would be a little under $60,000. We've applied for a $25,000 grant, and tonight I'm asking you all to sign a letter in support of that grant if this is a direction that you want to go in. Um, and I'm also just sort of looking for a nod that we should continue to move in this direction. Unless fundamentally you really don't see this as something that the city uh, rec department should take on. Uh, we did have an ice rink uh, before me at the pool. It was somewhat dangerous. <laughs> so it's not um, completely new for the rec department to take on an ice skating rink. The design is cleaner, it's more professional, um, it has, uh, the old rink was a, you know, a wooden fence. The old rink was shaped like this so that the water ha had to be very deep at one end and it would never freeze, took forever to freeze. This rink will have a flat four inch water level so it'll stay frozen longer that's more skatable days we'd open it before the holidays so be open during the holidays and we close it earlier it stayed open too long this year through uh too many warm days so i'm here to at with two asks do you want to con continue to pursue this uh this involves some private fundraising as well um, and if so would you be willing to sign the letter for the grant, supporting the grant. And I'll take your questions. So I've got a question about um, added insurance costs. Or it shouldn't be. This has been covered under our liability policy, and we've never had any problem with the old rink. This would be, uh, we have covered the volunteer rink. So we will okay. continue to cover this rink. Um, and size-wise, is it a similar size, or is it larger? At this moment in this year, it would be the same size. This would be a plexiglass siding, and you can buy it in sheets, so that if a couple of years down the road we want to make it bigger, we can do that. They chose not to this year because the liner's very expensive, so it'll mean buying a new liner to go bigger. Um, the state's also looking at doing something permanent in front of the uh, Supreme Court building, but that's at least five years out and probably longer, so. We didn't want to make too many changes. If we were to, if they are to do that, I assume that the rink would have some kind of value. We could sell it at the, yes. the remaining. Well, they probably five years. use pieces of it that they would purchase from us. Donna, I admit I'm <coughs> a little foggy, having been in the car all day. <laughs> but you, you mentioned it didn't seem appropriate for the recreation department. Oh, no. Um, so this would go under the recreation department? It would department. go under the recreation department, and what I was saying was it yeah. would be appropriate. They'd actually run an ice skating rink <coughs> at I the pool. So. No, no, I just, that one verb I, I got wrong. Okay. And they would work in conjunction. The fire department helps them fill it, does it not? They do. Yeah. Okay. Good. I, mean, I love it. Yes, I agree. I think it's great. 
So, what do you need from us? That's probably it, and I'll circulate a letter if, to support the grant. Great. Uh, at some point, I'm going to be optimistic that we're going to get the full grant. We're going to find full funding. Um, the city, the rec departments, um, has a special fund. It's got uh, close to $400,000 in it. It's for one-time purchases. And that's where the match would come from. At some point, I might have to come back to you all and talk a little bit about how much should come from that fund. But at this point, we're optimistic we're going to try to whittle that number down as low as we can. So I think, I think the action requested is approval of the letter of support and yes. general um, approval of moving to forward move forward, in forward with the planning. I would, with one, one uh, condition, that my name gets added to it. <laughs> well, that was what I would You want it named this? after you, Jack? <laughs> no, 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 it's not. It's a letter. Oh, I'm it's, sorry. My name is on the letter or on the uh, letterhead. Yes, we'll, so, oh, we'll, we'll add you. I definitely need this sign. Version of it. I have a, I'll have a final version to get you to sign. No, I put him on mine. Dave got Jack, did you actually make the motion? Yes, I did. Okay, I'll second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion right. carried. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sue. All right. Any other business? Uh, we have the council reports oh, and all that. Well, in well, the, the executive session. Part executive right. session at the end. Right. Did, Bill, were you going to do some of the parking garage in public? I can, yeah. Um, one to do, so that could be under my council, the manager's report. Why don't we? Sure. Why don't we just get? I think we the started there last time, so Donna will start. Council with report's you. done okay. first. I just like to remind everybody the contest to name our shared youth pass path is happening. It'll run through September third. And the form is a printed form, or you can go right online and get it. And you can submit it at the city clerk's, a little box in there, or you can do it directly online. But please, get creative and name our path. Honor. All right. Just, uh, I, I was able to uh, attend my first Montpelier Alive meeting as the council liaison. Um, fantastic group of volunteers, and uh, a big thank you to both them and all the city employees for a uh, Third of July celebration that I think went off without a hitch. It was a huge success. Uh, having tomatoes thrown at the council float was a bit hurtful, but uh, other than that, great stuff. So, <laughs> thanks. Um, I also got to attend a first meeting for me. I went to the uh, T.W. Wood Gallery board meeting last week, and it was great. I would encourage everyone to go and visit the gallery. Um, it is. Uh, uh, little notice treasure, I think, in Montpelier, and I really look forward to uh, their continued success. I was glad to be there. Um, and again, as always, I'll be at Baguito's tomorrow morning, Thursday mornings, 8.30 to 9.30, if anyone wants to come and talk. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and it continues to be. Oh, I have my own slot. Oh, you, oh, okay, okay. Um, so I would love to thank the Senior Center for the Senior Prom. I don't think we've had a council meeting since then. It is my favorite night in Montpelier, um, and city staff did an amazing job putting that all together. Mayor Watson and I were there, um, and it was really, it was a really great evening. Um, I, again, I'd, I'd like to echo what Connor said about the 3rd of July uh, celebration. And also this past weekend, there were a bunch of things that went on here in town. I saw lots of pictures online on the city website, and um, Montpelier Live had some great photos too. And I really, I commend the city for all that it's doing, um, especially, you know, the extra stuff like that that's really what it's all about. I'll pass this weekend. I'll pass as well. Bill and or nope, oh, John first. John. Just really quick, the second public meeting of the informal group talking about non-citizen voting happened uh, just this yesterday. Excuse me, and um, there was some model language that a working group had put together, and that then had been run by uh, Dan Richardson, who's who's gotten involved and is involved. Um, and there was general support in the room. Uh, you know, a little bit of concern about a couple issues, but general support. We're not planning any more 
uh, public meetings, certainly I'm not, so it's just a matter of whether there was enough energy in that room to pick it up and, and go with it and take it to petition. So uh, we'll see. There was some interest from the working group to maybe do some of that, but now it's all sort of wait and see. Um, only other thing I'd mention is that uh, with Crystal still out, uh, and she's been out for several months now and will probably continue to be out for at least another month or two. Uh, I have uh, temporarily hired Cindy Larson, who used to work in the office ways back. She's working about 20 hours a week. And Lee Youngman, who is the co-owner of the yarn store down here, is in eight hours a week helping uh, as a recording clerk. So. Yeah, I've just got a couple things. One, um, we were going to have written copies of the strategic plan for you tonight, and unfortunately our ace, Jamie, had a migraine today, so <laughs> those didn't happen, but we'll get them for you. I, I don't know if you want to wait to log us. We may just have them so you can pick up, but they were going to be on your desks tonight. I'm sorry that that didn't happen. Um, it was clearly above the rest of us to be able to figure out how to do it, so um, there you go. She's gone. We're all shut down. Um, Tomorrow we have the second round of meetings with VEPSI concerning the TIF application, so we'll talk a little about that, but uh, so far so good. Uh, one Taylor, just briefly, we have some, uh, looks like August 2nd, uh, the work is going to begin. Uh, August 3rd, the uh, uh, Housing Vermont is closing, thanks to your approval of this tonight, so they'll be closing on their financing for the housing project. We have we today signed all the deeds, all the railroad transfers, so all of that's done. Uh, all the, the, there's no other land transfers or anything to happen. Uh, and um, the asbestos removal will begin shortly within the week uh, at the two businesses, and as soon as that's done, um, those buildings will come down. So things are gonna, next week or two, gonna be a lot happening on that front, seeing that project starting and then I think the bike path is right behind it uh, so I don't know the exact schedule for that but it's coming soon so those are my three great all right so I believe we have a few matters to take up an executive session uh, I don't believe we're going to be coming back out other than to come out of executive session and adjourn the meeting so I, I did want to start the parking garage discussion um, obviously I think we, the, the details of a contract proposal <coughs> would be an executive session but Stevens here and um, we did you know we did announce a lot of information this past week about it um, based on prior conversations but we are talking about a 350 probably actually a 348 unit garage we'll be talking with the neighboring properties uh, the one neighboring property for whom we do have a 49 year lease on and I think uh, that's going to work out just fine potentially expanding obviously a lot of details about costs and those things being worked through uh, and uh, the issues being negotiated that we'll we'll talk about in detail obviously include parking rates land acquisition costs uh, management of the system that kind of thing but the the th current thought is that the, um, the city would own and operate and lease, you know, sell permits to the tenants, including the uh, Capitol Plaza Hampton Inn. Uh, and I'm probably forgetting something, but those are the basic structures. It would be helpful, I think, one of the questions that VEPSI board had was whether the council, uh, you know, our, our initial TIF application was done not knowing details. This, project was unfolding and it mentioned a 250 unit garage is one of the questions they had for us is the council okay with the general direction of a larger garage and where we're going so any you know they'll get asked us that tomorrow so any any thoughts that people have about that would be helpful you don't need to take a formal vote because obviously nothing's final but uh, that is something that's that they're going to want to know and otherwise we'll Oh, sure. Uh, I have one question, though, if I could. Yeah. Um, given the, the increase in the number of cars that you're looking to to park in this garage, does the traffic study that was done for the original application still apply, or are you going to have We'd to have to have an amended application. Okay. And, a, and, a tra and another traffic study, or...? So it would probably be an up, you know, you'd use the same one and get the same people to do an update with the additional okay. information. It wouldn't be a full do, because... Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.
Um, so I'm not sure. I guess I'm, I'm unclear how much. Just, well, we can't talk about the details of negotiations, but I think in general the, the you know, we've got a, we've got a, I'm going to have to say something at a public meeting tomorrow about the direction of the garage, and um, so it would be helpful to get some sense of where we're at. To do a bit of a round robin, everybody just. I'm in favor that we try to max out our, our city need beyond the hotel with this parking garage and that we built this structure and let's hope we only have to build one. In the same place? Yeah, if we have to build a parking garage, uh, we should make sure it's enough. And so, yes, it seems like. Generally the same place. I do have some concerns about what's left of the Heaney lot and making sure that we utilize that in a way that makes sense um, if, if this new garage eats into that um, from the the rendering that I've seen, I'm not really, I don't want it to be just an unusable, undesirable space. So that's my one, one concern there. I think we're going the right direction. Oh, well, you didn't Well, <laughs> alone to center, I suppose. Uh, I, I, think, I think I've, I've voiced my concerns in the past. Again, adding another 100 spaces is a significant cost increase with the steel prices sort of fluctuating as they are and other raw materials costs as they are. There's a lot of uncertainty, and I'm not saying that we balance our entire existence here in Montpelier on that uncertainty, but that is a significant dollar amount of increase. Uh, and. I am not comfortable saying that that's the direction that we should be going at all right now. So. Fair enough. Okay. Well, I mean, and I'm happy to answer anybody's questions or Stevens or anybody else while we're in public session um, to the extent that we can. I want to, but other, sure. So do we know what that garage might cost to just pull apart? Uh, about, well, I'd say nine and a half million is the number we're working with now. Maybe ten. Ten. We put ten in the report, and then it looks like it might be a little bit less. But that's the, that ballpark hasn't really changed. And that's at the th with the three hundred and fifty yes. spaces. Yes. I had a question. I wasn't not sure if this is appropriate for public session or executive session. So you can tell me in the way they're. Uh, the cost per uh, space seems lower in the latest uh, financials we've got. So we should, that's probably, that's a negotiating okay. bit, but, uh, but in general, well, in general, part of it was because we did, we, we got a more firm price, so the, the cost came down a little, so that was, we were able to put some more in there. All right. So given that we have concluded agenda business, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. And would you go in for both items? You have two separate items, but rather than going in and coming out? And yes, I think we should just do both at once. I'll second. For the reasons provided. In the So the other item that. is a, a potential real estate purchase. And, for, and actually that one, I think you have to have the finding that potential uh, advanced disclosure could put us at a disadvantage. Has to do with the bike path. So do you want, do you want John Connor to amend language? what he yeah. stated? His yeah, question? sure. I move to go into executive session to address the uh, parking garage and the uh, real estate acquisition. Let's do it to what the SA section 313 A2. Yes. Yeah, what he said. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's why I second. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.